Ladies and gentlemen, it is a moment of great honor for us that the Honorable Union Minister, Sri Arun Jaitley Ji, will be addressing the gathering via video conferencing. May I now request that the live stream may please be displayed on the screen so that we may be connected with the Honorable Minister. My two distinguished colleagues, uh, Shri Piyush Goyal and Shri Shiv Prakash Shuklaji, Dr. Hasmo Padia, the Finance Secretary, the Chairperson of the CBIC, Shri Ramesh, Member GST, Shri Mahindra Singh, Secretaries, Government of India, who are present here today. the Chief Economic Advisor, Dr. Arvind Subramanian, two former chairpersons of the CBIC, who in the last three years had a very key role, Sri Najib Shah and Srimati Vanjana Sarna, other distinguished officers, heads of various chambers, ladies and gentlemen. Today marks the first anniversary of a monumental economic reform which was carried on in this country, the imposition of the goods and services tax. The need for its imposition was very obvious because prior to the 1st of July last year, we unquestionably had one of the most complicated, if not one of the most clumsy, indirect tax systems in the country. Anyone doing business had to face 17 indirect taxes and multiple cesses. He had to file multiple returns, have an interface with multiple authorities, had to suffer the cascading effect of tax on tax, which added to inflationary pressures on the economy. Each territorial jurisdiction of a state required a separate rate and a separate return. There was no free flow of goods or services across the country. Though an independent nation, politically sovereign and one, India had fragmented markets and therefore it was absolutely necessary that India switches over to a more efficient system, a system which doesn't uh, involve these complications and in fact persuades people on the ease of doing business to pay their taxes. My own experience since the economic reform started in India in 1991 has been that no reform of this magnitude is ever possible till the head of the government, the Prime Minister, stands strongly behind that reform. In the case of the GST, we had an unequivocal support of the Prime Minister and therefore we could proceed further and enter into arrangements with the various states to go ahead with this. My second experience has been that whenever a major reform of this magnitude is to be implemented, there will be many in the system who will advise you either not to go ahead with the reform or to postpone its implementation. They will start highlighting the dangerous consequences of implementation. And once you waver, then reform becomes extremely difficult. We face this experience in the case of GST also. 
and therefore we disregarded the advice of those who wanted either a deferment or an indefinite postponement. We analyzed the reasons why governments in the past had failed to implement this reform. They were committed to the GST, but they could never create a comfort level with the state governments that keeping in mind the federal character of India, the concerns of the states would be respected. Let me give you two illustrations. The states were told earlier that you abolish the CST and the center would compensate you for the, with the CST composition, compensation. The states acted accordingly, but the center never provided them the CST compensation. When I took over in May 2014, the states categorically told me that till the central government agrees to provide us with the CST compensation, it's difficult for the states to trust the word of the central government. And therefore, liabilities incurred in the past were discharged by us to the satisfaction of the states. The second reason was that the states were obviously scared or apprehensive of the fear of the unknown. What if my revenue falls? How am I to be compensated? If the government had no response to this, the states, particularly the manufacturing states, were unwilling to join in. And therefore, we realized the genuine concern of the states and put it as a part of the Constitution Amendment that for the first five years, the states would be guaranteed from the GST collections a 14% annual growth of their taxes. This put the states at a high comfort level. Having conceded these two major points to the states, we got something back from the states. The amendment to the constitution proposed by the earlier governments had permanently kept petroleum products out of the GST. We persuaded the states to bring petroleum products within the GST but assured them that the tax would be levied only once the GST council agrees. And therefore, in the matter of petroleum products, we moved one step ahead. We consistently kept in mind the federal principles on which the delicate balance of governance in India rests. 